you know, when we talk about things we won't do, a lot of that comes around risk management. We don't guarantee loans. And this is a very clear message to our team because the quickest way to go broke in real estate is start guaranteeing loans. I mean, I know plenty of people who, you know, are, are much wealthier than I am who have gone broke doing that. And so my partner and I decided long, long ago that there's just some lines that we won't cross. And our team knows that because, um, you know, he coined this, but, but we don't want to say the words, you know, I used to be rich, right? Nobody wants to say those words. <laughs> and that's what this is about. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holiday, and today we have on the show with us Mr. Michael Episcope. Michael, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me, Evan. Yes. Very glad to have on Michael on the show today. Uh, before we go into Michael's background and get started, I do want to say a little bit about Monumental uh, and what, what we are doing here today and what is the purpose here. We're really wanting to dive into individuals like Michael who are making massive monumental change and positive impact in the world, uh, whether it's leaders, entrepreneurs, entrepre entrepreneurs, uh, real estate investors, those making an impact in the world uh, and helping share you know, what they've done, their trials, their tribulations, their ups, their downs to help you on your journey of making a monumental impact. Uh, so also, if you haven't already, please uh, share this episode and also share the podcast with somebody uh, that you know or share it on social media. And also please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts uh, or wherever you're listening today. That really helps us spread the word of our great guests like Michael today. All right. So uh, Michael is the principal of Origin Investments and brings 25 years of investment and risk management experience to the company and believes that calculated risk taking in efficient markets is the key to building wealth. He frequently shares his knowledge with individual investors on their blog, uh, Forbes, Value Walk, and HuffPost, and his expertise has made him a frequent speaker on the real estate investment panels and podcasts. Uh, with that, uh, and, and we'll dive into a little bit more of what Origin does and, and how they do it, but with that, let's dive into a little bit of your background, Michael. Sure. Happy to uh, fill that in a little bit. Um... So I guess, uh, you know, we have an hour here, I think. So I'll, I'll give you the um, <laughs> long version rather than the bridge version. Um, going back, this is actually my second career. My first career was as a commodities trader. I, I spent um, about 15 years in that business, 10 of it trading. Um, I was, uh, I've lived in Chicago since 1988. I went to school here, attended DePaul University. And after my freshman year, I decided that um, I really loved being down on the floors of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I stayed there, um, did a number of different jobs. I was a clerk. I was a broker, you know, just kind of made my way up. And then I became a trader in 1997. And I did that for about nine years. And it turned out that I was pretty good at it. And I had a very steep learning curve. It didn't take me long to catch on. Um, everything I'd done on sort of the outside of the pit um, translated to inside and, and made me a good trader. And I worked for a hedge fund for probably the first year, uh, then went off on my own. After that, I was able to capitalize myself. I uh, bought my own seat and then just traded my own account. And, you know, that was a great sort of nine years of my life. And when I look back, it, it, it was also transformational, not just from a wealth creation standpoint, but the year that I started trading, I, I met my wife. And, you know, prior to that, when I made the decision to go start trading, I'm like, look, if this doesn't work out, I'm not going to lose anything. I need to bet on myself at this time. And I was about 27 years old at that point. Um, and I'm glad I did. But, you know, when I fast forward to sort of the end of that career, the end of the nine years, I worked really hard. Um, computers came into that system and then ultimately sort of displaced me. But I was tired. I was done. I had built up enough wealth and I was ready to move on for the next thing. And the other thing that happened during that period was I got married. Um, I had two kids. I had another one on the way. It was no longer just about me. And I just decided that, look, even if I stay down here and I continue to trade and make money, it's not really going to change my life. Um, so I, I made the conscious decision of punching out of that business, retiring completely, retooling myself. And I ended up going back to uh, DePaul University and getting a master's in real estate. And so that was kind of how I transitioned. And I did everything from close my account down to sold my seat, made sure that I couldn't touch it, didn't want to trade. And I no returned. 
Yeah. Well, I, I traded for a little bit off the floor, but I always tell people, look, I wasn't a good trader because I could see around corners. I knew how to get edge. I knew how to take advantage of what was happening in the market. And so, you know, when I was doing a dabbling outside the pit, it was just like donations. And I said, I've got better charities to give this money to than, you know, whoever's on the other side of these trades. So that was sort of the beginning. And I went back to grad school because number one, I wanted to be educated and I really wanted to sit at the table and have the same amount of knowledge, learn about the markets, kind of figure out where I wanted to be in the market, build a network. And that was, you know, one of the best decisions I, uh, I ever made. And at that time, um, my partner and I were also working on a nonprofit together called One Million Degrees. Um, that's what it's called today. Um, so we had gotten to know each other really, really well. We were great friends. We worked on a nonprofit together, one that, you know, he um, really started. And then um, we decided to kind of formalize that in the business of origin because we were both two high net worth individuals who wanted to put our money to work in real estate. We wanted to, the tax benefits. We wanted the passive income. We wanted to continue to grow our capital because let's face it, whatever wealth looks, looks like today or 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you know, if you're not continuing to grow that wealth or turn it into passive income, it can disappear really, really quickly. So, you know, that's one thing that's always motivated me is that that fear of running out of money, that fear of being broke and, you know, the motivation of financial independence. And so once I had money, it was like, okay, how do I keep this? How do I maintain my lifestyle? Right. And it's not just about me. It's now about my family. So David and I got together in 2007. We really didn't have, a, you know, as we talked about a vivid vision of where we wanted to be, we wanted to put our money in real estate. And that was it. And we couldn't find, you know, this is pre-Jobs Act, everything out there. And, and I had invested with other groups he had, and we kind of just said, look, we can do better. And we started, um, you know, at a really good time in 07, because the market was starting to show cracks in 08. We started buying debt, did really well. And then it was really um, kind of in 2009, we said, what do we want to be when we grow up? And, and that's when we said, look, let's, let's actually, um, we bought some amazing deals in 09. And so we got- Michael, real quick, um, what, how old were you when you asked yourself that question? <laughs> what do I, well, when I say, what do we want to be when we grow up? I, we meant the, you know, the kind of the firm of origin. So I'm still asking myself that same question today. So, <laughs> no, I just um, wanted to bring well, that up because I think that's important. Yeah, I'm, I'm 50, but I still feel like I've got a pretty good runway uh, ahead of me. Um, yeah, but that was in the, in the kind of context of origin. And so, you know, what we did is, is we started syndicating deals and we knew that, look, we have phenomenal deals that we could capitalize ourselves, but we want to show these people, start building a business around this. And that's kind of how we formed Origin. So after that, we sort of parlayed that into our first fund. Fund one was a 2011 vintage. It was only um, $20 million of committed capital, eight of which was ours. Um, we grew that to $50 million by syndicating. That deal did you know, incredibly well. It was a top decile performer. Um, launched then fund two, which you know, wasn't that much bigger. We were about 40 million in that fund at that time that grew to about $100 million because when we found deals that were just too big for the fund, we would syndicate them. So if a deal came in and it was $18 million, we'd send that out to investors. And that's what I mean by growing from 40 to $100 million. And it was really after fund two because we were taking the same route that everybody else was, right? It's a very... Um, common route for people to start with their own capital if they have it, move to friends and family, move to their network, and then go on to institutional. And we were going down that route. And, and it was kind of like the groups we were talking to didn't really, you know, we didn't love the idea. Like, is this really what life is about is serving an institution, a pension fund, working for them and, you know, adhering to them and waking up every day, knowing that, you know, you, you kind yeah. of have a boss out there. And we said, look, not, really like we're really good at this which is um investing on behalf of ourselves and high net worth individuals and so why don't we scale this and that's when we started you know we kind of looked at the jobs act what other companies were doing out there and you know it's not rocket science to say like if you've got a great product and you put it in front of millions of people you're going to sell it and that was the whole thesis at that time so we invested in technology we invested in marketing and we just started marketing to high net worth investors and over the years it has just built on itself you know fund one was 35 people fund two was 70 people fund three was 450 people and today we have almost 1700 investors so we've grown exponentially um, really I think for three reasons one 
because of our returns. Two is because this level of alignment, you know, the amount of money David and I are investing and just the whole philosophy behind what we're um, what we're doing. And, and the third is we have surrounded ourselves with a great team. Um, we have 30 people today. Most of the people on the real estate side emanate from larger organizations, um, you know, household names, Deutsche Bank, equity, places like that, that you would know of. And so, and, and we really built this in our own vision, you know, at that point um, to say, look, if we didn't work here, would we invest here, right? And, and you have to look at the team, you have to look at the structure, you have to look at um, you know, just everything, all the pages of the PPM, right? Like sort of the, those gotcha points. And so we've always looked at it from, you know, the investor side and the manager side, and it feels really good. And I'll never forget one of our um, team members in the investor relations department, he started very early, about three or four years ago, he said to me, he said, you know what I love about my job? There's never a gotcha moment. Investors pour through the PPM and they're looking for it because most people out there, you know, approach everything skeptical as they should. And, and I would say 90% of the time, you're going to look through the PPM and there it is on page 43, 44, or 45 are all the hidden fees and structures and everything else that, you know, kind of show how the manager is making money. And we've just never believed in that. We're, we're playing this for the long game. So it's been, um, it's been a really good run. We have two funds that are open today, an income plus fund that's really got three, has three strategies in it that we, uh, we build, we lend and we acquire um, value add and core plus within that fund. It's all multifamily. And then we've got a qualified opportunity zone fund. So I like to say that we help high net worth investors make the most out of their money. You know, the wealthy out there, um, they need a fair shake as well. And, and they, you know, are looking to do the same things we are, which is generate passive income in a tax efficient manager, manner and continue to grow their wealth. And, and that's kind of our entire philosophy of what we're doing. And that's why we invest so much in our funds as well. Wow. I love that, Michael. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, a lot of different directions we could go in, but let's start toward the beginning of origin. Um, how, how did you and your partner figure out uh, kind of the direction you wanted to head in from the very beginning? How, how did that morph into what it is today? Well, I, I would say this, that, you know, the number one rule is investing in investing is don't lose money. And, and that's how we thought about it. We were already wealthy individuals and we weren't coming in here to take a lot of risk, leverage our money up, do all this. And so in the beginning, we were sort of figuring it out. And, and in 07, when the market was falling apart in 08, we discovered the area of distressed debt. And, we were, and somebody came into our office one day and wanted us to refinance um, a piece of debt that got sold. And the light bulb went off and we said, well, what do you mean it got sold? And, and he came in and he said, yeah, I've got an $8 million loan and these guys bought it for 3 million and they want me to pay it off for 4 million, you know, in 30 days. I'm like, well, that's where we want to be, you know, where those guys were. So we immediately kind of shifted gears and in 08 and 09, we started buying notes and um, you know, we had a distinct advantage at that time because we had capital and we had people yeah. who believed in us and, you know, in 09 and when we could raise and we can close deals because everybody else's hands were in their pocket and they were just playing defense. Um, so that was it. And, and then out of that, what happened is the distressed debt market sort of started to go away in 2010 and 11. And there were deals out there that were being sold as REO. Um, and what we really liked during that period was the... Um, was the value added um, area. And, and so we, we started focusing on that, but we also knew that we wanted to structure this in a fund, that we wanted the ability to go to the closing table and have the, uh, the answer for how are you gonna close this deal? And a fund does that. And a fund in many ways, um, there's a huge advantage to the investor as well in the sense that um, you know, all of our, as a manager, all of our performance fees are cross collateralized under one single structure, right? And they're diversified on that end. So it wasn't because the fund benefited us, but it did in the sense that we can go to the table and say, look, we have, we have capital here where we can close. And right. so that was sort of the beginning of the end, but you know, it was also at a time when capital had all the leverage and that was fun one. And we were very broad. We were agnostic about asset class. We were just looking for um, opportunistic deals in the market. And then that evolved, um, into fund two, which then we narrowed the world down. We expanded the team. We said, look, we're going to do retail office um, and I'm sorry, um, office industrial and multifamily. And so we narrowed the world down and, and that was a better message to the market. And that's sort of how things have been going. So 
we didn't, you know, the vision for, I think the capital raising side happened after fund two. We said, you know, back to who do we want to be and who do we want to serve? And it's really like, there's a lot of people out there who work really, really hard for their money to save, you know, 500,000, a million, 2 million, you know, and want something else other than the stock market. And when we got into this um, business, the, where a lot of people were investing their money or the target were the non-traded private REITs. And you look at those and you're like, this is awful. They're, they're charging 12, 13, 14% on the front end. They're hiding behind non-transparency. It was just, it was just bad. And, and so when we came into the market, we really wanted to do our best to disrupt that side. And I think the Jobs Act has really accelerated the proliferation of companies like ours out there and opened up uh, the kimono. So people say, look, we're no longer going to invest in those. There, there are more choices out there. Unfortunately, they still do well today. Um, but that's really what we were countering out there with these, you know, high fee, um, just poor real estate investment firms. And we wanted to bring something better um, to the market. So that I would say after fund two is when our, our entire plan began to synthesize or crystallize but it's still evolving. You know, we react to the markets. And so today, like in our last fund, fund three, we're office and multifamily. We're getting out of office for a lot of reasons. Today, we're only multifamily. Um, and from, a, from an organizational perspective, it's great because our team is an expert, right? Down to the nickels, the pennies, the dimes. And as the market evolved from the leverage being with capital, you have to know, um, you have to be an operational expert and understand when you're acquiring because the margins were so much are so much smaller today that you know if, if you bought a deal in 2011 and you paid a little bit higher of a price or you got some things wrong on right. the um, the pro forma side the market right. let you out of it today that's not the case yeah. you have to know how to operate efficiently so i love the fact that we're only um, multifamily the markets we're in we have you know again three strategies within that so we've got plenty to do but today we're not we're not buying anything stabilized because the risk return just isn't there. So we're focusing on building and lending in today's market. That's really interesting. And I, I find that so interesting how, uh, you know, your, your philosophy and your game plan behind origin has changed as the opportunities in the market have changed. I mean, going from distressed debt to office and value add and, and now solely multifamily, but then within that still having three different focuses. Um, that's really interesting. Just hearing the, the opportunistic approach. Um, how, how do you think you've been successful over so many different asset classes? Well, I'll, I'll back up because I think while the investment strategy has changed, the purpose of what we're doing has not. And, and it's always been about investing our capital, making money for us and our investors. And, and we've always believed in sort of being opportunistic in, in the environment. Now, the environment has changed a lot. And I think where we are today is much more beneficial. But the way that we are successful um, is our team. Um, our team, as I, I said, we've had, you know, our senior team members have been with us um, 12 years, 10 years, eight years, six years, you know, so through the life of these funds. And they came to the company with the experience in those asset classes. So we also, you know, a lot of what we do too is we joint venture and we joint venture with best in class sponsors out there. And, and so our job in many ways is, is finding good people to invest with and put our money with right now. In no way are we passive, but we come to the table um, right. with 90% of the equity, 95% of the equity, because we are not we're, we're vertically integrated to the point of investment management, but we are not vertically integrated in, um, in construction management in those areas and or even property management. And that's really by design because there's an inherent conflict of interest between an investment management company and a property management company and a construction company. And when you think about our decision, when our decision to sell a deal, right, it's, it's about selling the deal. That's it. It's not about how right. do we, you know, what do we do with these seven people at the property once we sell that deal? And by the way, that's feeding our property management arm. So, hey, let's not sell that over here. Or, you know, are we developing just for the sake of developing because we've got 40 people in our construction department. So when we want to shut off the spigot and when development no longer makes sense, guess what? 
we're not going to develop anymore. And there's no, you know, there's nobody at our firm who is really going to be crying about that because we don't have these ancillary streams. So a lot of, you know, what you do and what you don't do is very important. And what we don't do um, has been as much thought about that has been, has gone into our strategy as what we do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important to kind of understand the, the arc of how we got to here and, and what we do. But, um, you know, again, back to your question, it's, it's our team that's allowed us to be entrepreneurial, move across asset classes, um, you know, and get to where we are today. I love that. I love the line too. You said it's it just as important what you don't do as what you do do in your business. Uh, that's everybody should be writing that down right now. If you're listening, um, I, I 100% agree. I think it's so powerful. It's you know, it's what you say yes to. You're saying no to a hundred other things that you could be working on, or could be doing, or could be allocating your time and energy and resources. Yeah, to. and I'll tell you, Evan, just to comment on that, it, it's really important for the team to to have direction because and yeah. the market as well because if you go out to the market and, and, and a broker or somebody asks you, hey, what do you buy? And you say everything. And we're going to be like, okay, you are an expert <laughs> in nothing, right? But if you go to the market and you say, look, um, we're, you know, we're looking in these 12 markets and we're looking at multifamily projects that are, you know, to acquire that are 1990 and newer and with 10 foot ceilings and this and that, and you're giving them specifics. They know that when, when they have a project that fits that criteria, they're going to bring it to you. You yeah. are their buyer. And our team too, we don't want to waste their time. We don't want to send them on these goose chases and say, hey, just go look for everything. We'll tell you if it's good, right? That's not good for them either. And, you know, when we talk about things we won't do, a lot of that comes around risk management. We don't guarantee loans. And this is a very clear message to our team because the quickest way to go broke in real estate is start guaranteeing loans. I mean, I know plenty of people who, you know, are, are much wealthier than I am who have gone broke doing that. And so my partner and I decided long, long ago that there's just some lines that we won't cross. And our team knows that because, um, you know, he coined this, but, but we don't want to say the words, you know, I used to be rich, right? Nobody wants to say those words. And, and that's what this is about. It's the word um, nobody wants to nobody wants to say. Um, yeah, I used to be rich. Yeah, I want to dive into that just because I'm curious. Because um, you know we're we're signing more and more guarantees on more and more loans. Um, so I'd love to get kind of more feedback. And and for everybody listening, just a, a little you know kind of a precursor or background of this. Um, whenever you're working on uh, larger commercial real estate deals. Uh, your lenders typically require you to sign personal guarantees where you're personally allocating your assets, everything you own in case something goes wrong with that deal or that loan. And so it can be very risky, especially if you have multiple of these guarantee loans uh, that you're doing all at the same time. Um, and if multiple of them go bad, but um, I'd love to hear more about your strategy of why that's a like an absolute no go and, and also how you are getting around that. Yeah. So that's a great question. And there are always exceptions to the rule. And Evan, um, again, I came to this business with wealth and, and that's a huge difference, but I would always tell people, you know, my kids went into this business. I would say, look, bet on yourself. Yes. You should guarantee loans. You should do everything you need to do. And if you are an operator and you are in on the day to day, the nitty gritty of what you're doing, you can control your risk. Then you, then that's okay. But as somebody who has a lot of projects, who's relying on the partners, um, we're just not going to expose our fund or our fund investors to something like that. So if we, you know, and that's the responsibility of our joint venture partners, mm, but even yeah. in deals that are stabilized, when we go out, because these are, remember, class A, multifamily, 200 unit projects, 50, $60 million, there is a huge market out there for non-recourse loans. And, and that's sort of, you know, when we think about, you um, the advantage of being in real estate, especially in the larger the, the uh, you know size of the apartments, um, non-recourse lending is is one of the holy grails of real estate. And then you've right. got appreciation, and you've got you know um, the ability to refinance tax-free forever. You know, and so that's something that we take advantage of. But that's who we are, right? And I, I will say that if you are a passive investor and you're not involved in the day-to-day -day, and somebody is asking you to leverage up your balance sheet and they're gonna give you 1% of the project and do this, 
Well, then you better be very, very careful because personally, I would never do something like that. You know, and when we're talking about um, a fund, it, it's, you know, it's again, to me, it's not worth it. If I were in your shoes and I was starting out in this business and I were trying to build wealth and I were creating an operating platform and I were in the day to day, I would absolutely do it. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And especially when you're taking into, into account, um, you know, you have to be the the protector of the investors and the fund uh, and taking that right. into, you know, all your decision making. Um, yeah, so we're not looking to get people rich. We're looking to, you know, really keep people rich and wealthy and have their money work for them. Right? right. Our job is to make sure that we are protecting investors on day one, finding the right projects in the right market, structuring them appropriately, getting them built on time, on budget. And then, um, you know, if it's a building situation and then realizing the benefits of real estate, that's what we need to do as the manager, uh, you know, for on, on acting on behalf of investment, our investment partners. Right. Um, I, I want to dive into because you mentioned it quite a bit. And I think it's really important uh, for our listeners to kind of if we could peel back the curtain of what what is it like or what has it been like for you um, to build your team? You, you've talked about how important the team is. And I completely agree. I think any successful um group or corporation, it really takes a, 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 a rock star team, as I like to call it, uh, to make that happen. So how have you been able to, to find your team, assemble your team, and then make sure it's running like a well-oiled machine? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would say we adhere to the rule of hire slowly, fire quickly. Um, unfortunately, we don't get every hire right. And you know there are some team members who over time, they just matriculate on to something else. They have different interests in life, things like that, um, want to go off on their own. We, we haven't really lost anybody to competitors or anything like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, building a team is an evolution. You have to have a clear vision of what you want. David and I have always invested in the team ahead of our growth with the anticipation of growth. And that has served us well. It served our investors well. Um, but just, you know, and we have a, we have a set of core values that we actually email the team every other week when we send out weekly updates. So we believe in communication. We, you know, our core values are important, treat people with respect. We don't allow people to be rude at the office. We don't tolerate that. People have to be, um, you know, everybody at the team is hardworking and pulls their own weight. And it's, it's, a, it takes a lot of time. Um, and it's unfortunate when, it doesn't work out because there's a training element that goes into, you know, yeah. bringing a team member up. And when they leave, it's very disruptive. So bench strength is equally as important, um, making sure that every division has people who are, um, who have bench strength. And, and I think it's incumbent upon David and I as leaders of the company to continue to grow it and offer these people, um, you know, our entire team, more opportunities and advancements for growth. And, and that's, why people come to origin. And, and that's a lot of time what motivates me. I don't want to grow for the sake of growing, but when I see these young people who are so hungry and bright and brilliant, I mean, we can grow, you know, with um, our team and continue to, you know, give them the opportunities here and continue to maintain sort of the same value proposition um, that we've been delivering for the last, you know, 10, 12 years. And, and to that point, um, what, what was it like when you're first building out your team toward the, the start of origin, what, what was that like? And, and, um, and how did you go about, and you also mentioned a lot of your hires are typically from bigger firms. Um, so I'd love to hear more about how you're attracting yeah. that. Well, now. you're looking at the team right here. It was um, me and my partner, David, we, we were literally, I've done every job um, I've done underwriting. I've done asset management. I've done capital raising. I've done reporting. I've done accounting. So our team was very uh, small in the beginning. And, and it just, you know, you do the job because you have to as an entrepreneur and it's required and you know what you want the vision of the company to look like. Yeah. And my, you know, philosophy has always been, look, I want to hire people who are better than me, who are dedicated to this particular area. But I also have a need to sort of understand, because if you don't understand it at a very granular level, then you can't fix it. And you don't really know how to build it in your vision. So that was a very important part. But I'll never forget, I mean, my, when my partner and I, early on, we bought a portfolio of 100 homes in Florida and Cape Coral, and it was ground zero. And, and these were actually distressed notes back in 2008. 
And, you know, we're on the phone with these borrowers trying to get deed and lose. My partner's over there. He's speaking Spanish. I'm talking to borrowers. We're on the phone <laughs> with attorneys. We're going down there. Like we're, you know, everything short of mowing lawns. I'm not going to say that I did that, but I did hire <laughs> the lawn mowing, you know, company yeah. to do this. We know them down to about 12 bucks a cut, you know, when the bank was paying them like 80. So um, that was, that was the team in the beginning. And then we had some key hires. Um, Priya, who's our um, who's our controller right now, she's been with us 12 years. She celebrated um, her anniversary. Tom Briney has been with us for 10 years. He came over from Equity uh, Residential. Um, Dave Welk, who's our managing director of acquisitions, he came over from Reef um, right about then. And, and you know, we kind of joke when we when we talk to them now because they're you know still at the company, and we're like, man, what? How did we sell you guys on this? You know. <laughs> It was, it was just a vision, but they're fantastic. And, and actually, Dave, I met in uh, in grad school. So, you know, doing my master's and we had done some projects together. And he was, um, that was the best, you know, two-year interview I ever had. And he's been yeah. an absolute rock star. So it was Tom, so it was Priya. And I can name a lot of other people, but it happened organically. And, and you just continue to add people on. Um, I don't, you know, somebody said to David and I, hey, here's $50 million, go grow the firm. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if we can do that because it's just not in my nature to hire that quickly and, you know, just do the shotgun approach. So, you know, we, we want people to be at origin for the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years and really call this place home. And you do that by treating them with respect. You value their opinion. You give them opportunities for growth. Yeah, I love that. And that, that does speak volumes to hear uh, a lot of the really top talent now, you know, your main leadership of your company and being able to be with you for 10, 12 years. Uh, that speaks a lot to, to what you and David are doing. Um, and, and speaking of which, you mentioned vision a lot of being part of like how you're attracting that talent and also how you're helping lead the talent into the direction and, and being crystal clear with that direction helps them be able to take more action. Uh, and what, what were the steps for you and David to, to create that vision? Well, we've done, um, we've done a lot of offsite retreats with our team to give them a voice and our tagline, um, which is sort of our mission statement is transforming the way individuals invest in real estate. That was actually, um, it was very collaborative, but I think Dave Welk was the one who finally sort of crystallized that. He's actually a really good writer. Um, but we've done you know, many, many events like that. We just, um, as a team, you know, it's, it's I'm not going to say a family because a, a family denotes unconditional love. And, you know, the way we operate is more of a sense that everybody is um, accountable for their own department, but really good people, you don't have to manage. They're accountable at their, at their DNA level. And when you have to push somebody to be accountable, that generally isn't going to work out. So, you know, our job is to provide people clarity and direction, give them the tools they need. And, you know, for a long time, the team didn't have the tools they needed. We didn't have a mountain of capital. We didn't have, you know, huge um, investors backing us like other firms did. And so over time, we've evolved into the market, given them everything, um, you know, that they need to be successful. So it's something that, you know, we're continually um, just working on and, and making sure that um, the team evolves and that we make a great place for them to come to work to every day. I love that. And what about as far as like, do you have uh, either groups or individuals that you look up to or, or groups that you are, are modeling some of your own decision-making on? Yeah. I mean, you know, in a way we look at all of our competitors out there, right? Do I, do I want to, you know, do I aspire to be a certain group? Um, I think there are parts and pieces from a lot of organizations out there that we aspire to be, you know? And so we're, we are, you know, one of our core values is we are a continuous learning organization. And that is at the very highest to the lowest. And, and you have to have people who, are coachable, who want to learn, who, who believe that they have a lot to learn. And I think at Origin, um, you know, we are really good, but we're better today than we were a year ago. And we'll be better in a year than we were today. And we're always looking for ways to um, gain a competitive advantage. And, and one of the, the best examples, you know, this is our uh, acquisitions team. In the last year, they have built a machine learning tool 
uh, to really forecast growth rates across cities and all the way down to the submarket because we use a service called Axio and, and there's some challenges with Axio and we can't back test their data and they don't you know, give you all this. And so you don't understand how important forecasting is and growth rates are in a model. They can make or break a model. You, you put in, you know, 1% and, you know, the deal doesn't work. You put in yeah. 4% and the deal screams off the chart. So it's really, really important. Now, obviously you're not going to be able to forecast things like COVID, but understanding like, you know, like to go to Phoenix um, three years ago, you know, and stay away from other cities um, is, is, you know, part of the, the way that you invest, right? And, and getting those macro bets right. So what the machine learning does is it evaluates hundreds and hundreds of variables and distills them down into growth rates. And, and right now we're in the early stages of that, but the back testing looks really, really promising and much more than Axio. So that's sort of, you know, that's been on them, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a heartache and it's a problem that we've been trying to solve for years. And, you know, forecasting and, and predicting the future, nobody can do it exactly, but you can do it better. And that's yeah. what we set out to do there. And we have, you know, kind of a history of innovation, whether we're building our own technology or adopting technology. I just had a um, um, Modern Ventures who is in Chicago and they're a property technology venture investor. And David and I have actually invested with um, Constance Friedman for strategic reasons, because we get to now preview all of her technology that she's investing in. And it works both ways because we're giving her feedback on the technology if it's something we'd use um, in our day-to-day -day activity. So, um, you know, innovation is something that is, um, you know, just part of our DNA, but it's all, it's that part of continuous learning and making sure that everybody at the firm is, um, growing as an individual and person. And then the firm is also um, growing and we're evolving our strategy because I think the worst thing that people can do is, Hey, I'm doing business, you know, the same way I was 20 years ago. If you are doing that, then you are really close to going out of business because if not already, it's not out of us looking over your shoulder, trying to put you out of business. It's somebody, I mean, the markets yeah. have evolved. Yeah. Real estate has probably been slower but people who have not gotten up at the times and still have a business model from 1990, you're going to go out of business. Um, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, and I love that machine learning. That is really fascinating to me. Um, and in one quick question on that, do you, do you have people on staff or do you, do you outsource like the, the um, software engineering side of that? Or how did you, how did you do that? So we have hired um, two data scientists to actually build this on the side. So they are working wow. with our acquisitions and our investment team on that side and, and helping them kind of re, you know, um, just configure this model. Because the, the reality is what you have to do to build a system, you have to have the information in your head and sort of know where you want to go. And our, our team is great at that and they understand all the variables, but there's no way that the human mind can distill and scrape all this, this data right. from all these public sources and put it into one. So the data scientists, you know, they start out like, what do you want it to do? And, and how do we, how do we get it there? And you started in sort of the architecture and now let's get all that knowledge out of your head and put it on paper right. and see how we can bring it together. And, you know, Evan, in this market, you would be surprised. Like it, it really comes down to a few variables that really move the needle, but you have to know where the growth is going to happen um, and, and again, nowhere to stay away from. So I would say like, you know, we were talking about Nashville. The prospects in Nashville are still very good from an affordability standpoint. And affordability is one of the number one um, indicators of future investment performance. Because if you're building properties where people can afford the rents and there's room for upside, then you're going to be able to raise rents on those. And you hope that over time they're... Um, their salaries grow and, and, you know, their compensation grows in line with that. Right. But if you are renting um, right now, something, you know, a place like Denver, Denver has run up so quickly, um, you know, the rents and everything there that it's not as affordable as somewhere like Nashville. And so there's an upper limit. So the growth rates on deals that we're looking at in Denver are so much lower. And the only thing that you have to fix on that is price. So prices have to come down yeah. for us to jump back into Denver or, you know, we have to develop something more affordable on that side. Yeah, that is really interesting. Just the uh, quick aside, just the relationship between where rents are in relation to the local income levels, because that ultimately determines your upside uh, on, on that type of investing. 
Um, it, since you brought up machine learning, I did want to ask, um, I'm reading just a mind blowing book right now. It's called uh, blockchain revolution. And it's all about blockchain uh, and just how that is going to literally disrupt every single aspect of our lives and our business. Um, have you, have you dug into blockchain at all, or do you have any thoughts on blockchain? Uh, on a personal level, I have as a company, we have not. So that's something that we will wait on to see where it evolves, but that's not where we want to invest our capital today. Um, I am a huge believer in, um, in the blockchain industry, in the market. I love it. I can spend, you know, 20 minutes talking about it here. Um, but I'll just tell you from a real estate perspective, I know there are are some people sort of looking at ideas. We haven't seen anything that's compelling that would make us jump in or really help us do our jobs um, better. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I would love to, um, maybe at some other future date, but I'd love to hear more about like, because I'm, I'm trying to think about, I'm, I'm, as I'm reading this book, I'm like, what are the applications for real estate You know, that I would be interested in being a part of? Uh, I haven't come up with anything yet either, but uh, but I'm trying to think of something because I, I think it is just amazing, just kind of like the internet of the future. Absolutely. It'll come. Um, it, I'm sure it's coming down the pipeline. Somebody's going to do it. Um, we just haven't had it. And, you know, when it comes to it, we'll probably adopt it. Um, we won't build it in-house. That's just not our expertise. I love it. Um, as far as one last piece of advice that you would have for our monumental listeners um, on making sure that they can really, you know, have success both in, in their business and within impact. Uh, what would that advice be? Uh, good question. Um, I, I, I guess I'll just say in my own life, I try to find balance. Um, you know, it, I have three children. Um, I really prioritize them, especially at this stage in life and, you know, try to go to the baseball games and, and coach and do all those things. And when I think about, you know, what is success and what do I want, you know, you, you want to have success in business, everybody, you know, like whether you're not, that's part of your identity and you want to have success with your wife and your family and your kids and have those relationships and, and, um, you know, and then you want to leave some sort of legacy and help others, especially if you're, you're blessed with, um, having made, uh, you know, money and, and wealth and you can spread some of that around and um, help. And I, I think even more important than that is giving your time and, and mentoring um, people because there's a lot of young adults out there who really um, can benefit from the expertise that I have, you have, other listeners have on this as well. And, you know, some people are probably, oh, I don't know if they can. Well, I'll tell you, they can, you know, and I remember being, you know, even though I was 35 when I, you um, graduated from, well, actually I was, I was 35 when I left trading. I was about 37 when I graduated from uh, my master's in real estate, but I used to love um, taking the professors out to lunch and just hearing their stories and listening and soaking it up. And, you know, they probably didn't know that, but I had some mentors in those days and, you know, just, just hearing those stories were great and helped me avoid a lot of different things. So um, that's kind of how I, I view success in life. And, and it's just, it's about balance. So making sure that um, you know, if you have the opportunity, it, it's, it's not only about work, you know? Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right. Well, I feel like we could keep going and going, uh, but for the sake of time, let's dive into our monumental questions. Uh, okay. what does success mean to you? Well, Evan, I think I answered it, you know, just now it's about having, like when I look back in life, um, you know, what to do that was important? How is my relationship with my children, my wife, right? Am I living a life of, of purpose and, and a meaningful life? Um, or, you know, and am I treating people well? Because I don't, you know, I don't like arrogance. I don't like bullies. I don't, you know, like because people have money and they walk around with their chest puffed out, like that doesn't impress me at all. But what, what impresses me is when people really, you know, give back with their time, their effort and energy and and so it, it, that's what it's about is balance and really being um, nice to other people and leaving an impact. And, you know, when we're building a firm like this, when we say we've got 30 um, team members, well, that's 30 miles we have to feed. And most of our team members, they have, you know, not most, but I would say half of them have families. And so, you know, when David and I look at this, that's really important. And, and when I think about a firm that we're building well, there's a purpose behind it. And we really believe in what we're doing and believe that high net worth investors, people who have saved 
and, and done well, they deserve really good quality investments and they deserve to keep the majority of the profits that the, um, that the real estate produces, you know? And, and so again, when we were here, like when we were starting this, it's like, yeah, you saw some good developers out there, but they would keep 70%. You'd never be able to get ahead. And it was, too, you know, taking all the risk and two steps forward and, you know, maybe two steps back. And so it's meaningful on that side as well, that, you know, someday, you know, when origin exists beyond us, that it's still fulfilling its mission of, of really treating investors right, where, where people can invest and, and get a good shake and, and just having the name um you know spoken with reverence as well is, is important to uh, both my partner and me yeah that's really cool um what about your daily habits or morning rituals that you have hmm. starts with coffee every day <laughs> um morning rituals you know I, I don't have a lot of morning rituals i, I think i'm I, i'm up pretty early i love to wake up with the sun um i do yoga that's sort of what I'll call my active meditation. I love that. The older I get, the more I realize it's about stretching. It's about staying limber. It's about eating right and healthy. Um, what I don't do anymore, um, and I just started this, is I started intermittent fasting because I hired a nutrition guru. And um, this is something I just added on and I don't eat breakfast anymore. So I, I do kind of, I eat from noon till about eight o'clock. I might shrink that down, you know, from one to seven or you know, six hours, there's all kinds of benefits to um, intermittent fasting about having a, a clearer mind about, you know, um, reducing the risk of Alzheimer's, heart disease, there's weight loss, but all kinds of benefits. So I just started that this year and have gotten on a health kick of eating nothing but healthy foods. And it's really helped my, my mood, my mindset, everything, the way I feel about myself. So that is, um, you know, again, back to what we don't do and what we do. Um, and I could cut out any meal, I just chose breakfast and you'd be surprised I thought I was going to be hangry. I thought I was going to be awful. But once you cut sugars out of your life and you skip a meal, it's not a big deal at all. So it's been, um, it's been new to me. It's only been for about three weeks, but um, I really think it's something that I can continue um, to do for a long time. And, and I think I'm, you know, just feel better about myself. So I'm probably a nicer person around other people as well. <laughs> many, many benefits. Uh, yeah, that's, it's funny you say that I'd recently cut out sugar. Um, and same thing, it's, it makes a world of a difference. And I, I've been thinking about intermittent, intermittent fasting as being the next step. Cause I've heard so many good things about that too. Um, well, it's, it's so simple and, and not to get on the subject too much, but I was out on a golf trip on um, two weeks ago and I was in Bandit Dunes and the um, person I got um, roomed with, he, I was like, I'm not going to do this. There's no way I'm walking seven miles and I'm not going to eat breakfast. He says, I've been doing it for seven months. He's like, I'm going to, and I'm like, okay, well I'll, I'll do it then. Right. And I'm like, and I did it and, and I couldn't believe it. I, I golfed the whole day. I never felt hungry. And this guy actually went two rounds without eating. And I was just like, that was kind of insane. Um, but he's, he's taken it to a whole nother level. Cause when I heard about this, I'm like, there's no way I can't eat for a day. And then when yeah. he described, he was talking about kind of an, a, you know, a 16 hour period, I'm like done, you know? Wow. So, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, also side note, Bandon Dunes is a beautiful place. Um, oh, it, it was like no place I've ever seen. So, and we had the most incredible weather, 15 degree winds and sunny the whole time. And I've heard, um, you know, it can be blowing sideways and 30 degrees there. <laughs> um, last question. What about favorite book or book you are currently reading? Favorite book I've read. Um, this one really touched my heart. It's called The Color of Water. Hmm. The Color of Water is a story um, really about the power of education and parenting. And it was about a woman who grew up in the 1950s. Um, a Jewish woman, she grew up in the South. She fell in love with a black man. They got married. They were ostracized from, she was ostracized from her family. They moved to, I believe it was New York. Um, ultimately they had eight kids together. He died. She's in the projects now raising these kids herself. She gets married, has five more kids. He doesn't live with her and she has 13 kids. And this book was written by the youngest of these 13 kids. And I just get chills thinking about it now. Um, but the power of the book is just, you know, she was a force to be reckoned with and she was five foot nothing, skinny as a rail and just the way she ruled this family. And she knew how to get them the best education, how important that was. And every single one of these kids, you know, growing up in a project, growing up, you know, in poverty, they all graduated from college. I think, you know, 
10 of them had you know, post uh, graduate degrees. They, they were all very productive citizens. And, and so when I read that book, I mean, it was just unbelievably riveting and I couldn't put it down. Um, and that's kind of just a fun book. It's a quick read. I think anybody who, who picks that up will find it exhilarating. But again, I believe in the power of education for social mobility. Um, my wife and I, you know, when we think about our charitable giving, it's generally around um, educational uh, organizations on that side. And then the, um, you know, I can't remember, I'm actually listening to an audio book right now by Ben Horowitz. Um, and so he, um, I wish I could remember the name of it. It's good. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not picking up the book every day. I'm just hitting play. And, uh, is that and the hard it. thing about hard things? Yes. Yes. That is it. You know it. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Great book. Yeah. So that's the one I'm, I'm sort of listening to now. And I, I love the audio books these days where I just pop in the headphones, walk to work and, and listen and kind of space out. I love it. Um, yeah. Michael, thank you so much for everything that you've brought today to Monumental to our audience. Uh, I know this is going to be a value packed audience or value packed episode for our audience. Um, thank you again for that. Where can our Monumental audience, where can they reach out to you or connect with you? Well, they can always go to our website, um, origininvestments.com, or they can just email me, michael at origininvestments.com. Happy to answer any questions about the firm or just connect and chat about anything. Guys, take Michael up on that. Uh, he is a wealth of knowledge and doing some amazing work uh, with Origin. And guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to share it on social media, uh, share it with a friend. Also, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review today's episode or wherever you're listening today. And with that, guys, have a monumental day.